Okay, um, I am absolutely delighted to chair the first working group session of the day, and this is on healthcare delivery and management. So can I please invite the speaker, uh, Roy, and also the panelists up to the stage also? Whilst they're coming, I would like to say I might be biased, but I believe that this area is central to the whole commission process. Due to the interdisciplinary nature of surgery, if you invest in surgery, you actually also invest in a healthcare system. And arguably, if you have a healthcare system without surgery, do come on up, you have no healthcare system at all. In the UK, when we graduate, we graduate as MBCHB or MBBS. So that's Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery. And it seems that in most parts of the world, they've forgotten about the Bachelor of Surgery. And this commission is to try and put Bachelor of Surgery back into the healthcare system. So if the global health community is really, truly interested in universal health coverage and healthcare strengthening, they need to listen to this session to find out how to put surgical care into those health systems. So please take your seats. <coughs> Firstly, I would like to introduce our speaker, who is Nobudget Roy. He was the head of this working group on healthcare delivery and management. For his day job, uh, Roy is Chief of Surgical Services at the BAR, BARC Hospital and a public health specialist at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai, India. He's also the regional expert for the Institute of Health Metrics in Seattle, and he's part of the task force for developing standard surgical treatment guidelines for the Ministry of Health in India. So thank you, Roy. Roy will summarise this working group's findings, and after Roy has done that, we're going to invite comments from our panellists. So our panellists, I'll introduce now, are Lola Dare. Lola is founder of the Centre for Health Sciences, Training, Research and Development. This has a global reputation as being an African-led, non-state development agency. Lola has vast experience as a community physician, an epidemiologist, social development consultant, and also a global health advocate. She has a strong commitment to health system strengthening and accountability. So thank you, Lola, for being with us today. Thank you. Next, we have David Waters. David has recently been elected president of the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons. So congratulations, David. Mm -hmm. He is Professor of Surgery at Deakin University and also Director of Surgery at the University Hospital Geelong and Bar One Health in Victoria in Australia. His experience has been Director of the RACS and Pacific Islands Project and also the Papua New Guinea Project. He's also practised in Dili, Timor Leste as well as in other disadvantaged situations. So thank you David for being with us. Next on the panel, we have Mitt Phillips. Mitt has kindly joined us from the headquarters of MSF in Brussels. She's previously been director of operations there and is now health policy and medical advisor, advocacy advisor. Mitt's main work, as much of MSF, concentrates on is HIV and AIDS. However, she's got a lot of experience in health systems financing and financial barriers to healthcare as well as global health and health systems policies. And these, this experience is readily <coughs> transferable to the area of surgery. Last but not least, and I'm not sure whether our video link is going to work, Ed Kelly, who is Director for the Department of, surgery, uh, of Service Delivery and Safety at the WHO, should be joining us by video link, fingers crossed. Um, he's been busy fighting the Ebola epidemic, and, um, which is why he can't join us in person today. So Ed is involved in medical care quality and access, both within and outside of the US, before his post at the WHO. And he has also experience in working in Africa and Latin America. 
So with that, I've introduced our speaker and our panellists, and I'd like to ask Roy to take the stand and summarise the findings. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, Justine. Much inspired by Richard Horton, editor Richard Horton, I started keeping all my appendix in a pot on my table. <laughs> <laughs> but I gave up rather quickly. 22 years ago, I left this country and what I considered one of the best health systems in the world, the NHS, to go back to a rural part of India to set up a practice. And um, it's, it's been a journey because the first thing I realized after I started my practice, after my very expensive training around the world, was that I was inadequately trained. The thing which happens is that you have to be uh, multi-speciality when you're working in a rural area. And what you are trained in typically today is this siloed, highly specialized medicine and surgery. The second thing that we've, I, I realized in the early years of practice was that there's not much of literature out there which allows you to <coughs> understand what it is to treat people and operate on people who haven't had enough to eat and what it is to operate on people with anemia and have no blood. And my, uh, I, I would get fitness for surgery with a hemoglobin of seven, and that's because my wife was an anesthetist. Lastly, you feel very, very alone. You are alone, and there's a huge surgical burden of disease, and you're the beast of burden, and you are up against so, so many odds, and it's, it's very heartening to see two decades later an auditorium packed with people who are all very concerned with the same issue. So thank you very much. My group, um, we have been looking at strengthening the health systems in terms of health delivery and management. And the, and the situation has been that the surgical system is what we are trying to strengthen. Unlike other health crusades that we've had, we don't have a vaccine. We don't have something in surgery that we can put in a capsule and mass market. And a system is always very difficult to market because it's not really a disease. It's not a single disease. It's not like HIV. And when you map out the system, you start with the community. The community uh, moves to the primary care center and then to the district hospital, and then to the tertiary hospital. And that's the flow of the patients. But what happens in a typical LMIC? You have the first delay. When you're a daily wage worker, and every day that you don't show up at work, you don't, the day you don't show up at work, you don't get paid, you would try and delay your symptoms. You would try and pull it on and you would visit a traditional healer, and you would definitely not go to a doctor because that means loss of pay. So the first delay in an LMIC in the lower and middle income countries is the delay in seeking care. And this comes from the maternal model. We've adapted it to the surgical model. And so you don't leave home until you're so sick that you finally decide that I need to seek care, and that's the first delay. The second delay is the delay in reaching care. So once you've made up your mind that you need to see a surgeon or meet, meet, uh, get surgical attention, you, the next problem is how do you reach the hospital? And that's the second delay. No 911s, no ambulance services, so you've got to figure that out on your own. The third delay is at the hospital door. So just because you've reached a hospital doesn't mean that your care will begin. You're lucky if care begins, but usually care does not imme begin immediately because there are barriers at the hospital door which prevent you from, um, uh, from getting care. The first delay. The first delay is at the community level, and as I said, it's, it's a financial issue usually. There's a lack of awareness. The hospitals are, and the care locations are far away. There's a lot of distrust for, for a lot of the health systems that exist currently. And you wouldn't necessarily go, uh, like going to a hospital. You would be more comfortable with your traditional healer. And lastly, of course, there are cultural issues playing up. In the second delay, we have this whole business of long distances 
poor pre-hospital transportation, and who's going to pay for all the transportation to get to the hospital? And that's a huge sum of money, as Andy was referring to. The second delay, broken up into our world between low-income countries, middle-income countries, and high-income countries. You will see the bar on the right. Most high-income countries have hospitals with, uh, which are geographically very close. At a distance of uh, 5 to 10 kilometers, you would have some kind of access to health. And in the middle-income countries and in the low-income countries, it's, it's the, the bare minimum would be 35 to 40 kilometers. That's the median. And of course, there's transportation. Uh, 35 to 40 kilometers could mean an hour's travel or maybe even two hours' travel at the very minimum. The third delay is once you reach the hospital. And we found that in our study that even if you did reach the hospital, the first district level hospital was able to offer caesarean sections in 64% cases, op treatment of open fracture in 40%, and laparotomy in 58%. So that, that was the number which WHO has given us of, of the number of uh, operations which are possible at the district level hospital. And the reasons stated are very clear. It's the, there's no infrastructure, equipment not working, anesthetics not available, <laughs> supply chains are broken down, blood, ha blood banks have no blood, and staffing issues, lack of processes and protocols, and it's, it's, it's isolated from the entire system of healthcare system. So what typically happens is that we our whole approach in our group, the health delivery and management group, is to address each of these barriers because the patient has got to move and reach uh, care before they can be given care. So the strategies that we've seen, and this was uh, out of uh, healthcare, deliver, uh, healthcare personnel across the world who gave their narratives, and we found a lot of innovations happening there. One was that the, one of the best ways that, um, to, delay, uh, to, uh, to reduce the first delay was to use the community outreach workers. Community outreach workers have been used for communicable diseases and a bunch of other things, but they've never been used to pick up early surgical problems. So that was one of the innovations that we found in our research. Strategies for uh, reducing the second delay has been this is the model from BRAC, Bangladesh, where you, have, you don't have an ambulance, but you have a cycle ambulance, but the, the system is that it's all connected via mobi mobile phones, and that's where the connectivity is established. And another way to reduce the second delay has been to strengthen the existing network. So we've got experiments from Uganda where the taxi drivers are paid an incentive to bring in the trauma patients, and here are the police, who are always the frontline people, being taught at the, at the, um, uh, how to be able to uh, pre-hospital transport the patients. And of course, if in a mountainous country like Ecuador, um, this is a truck, which is an operation theater. And one of my colleagues and team members, Professor Edgar Rodas, and I'd like to pay my respects to him because this commission report was the last big contribution, his big contribution to surgery, and he passed away a couple of weeks ago. So when the, when the first level hospital does not deliver, what typically happens is that all the elective and the simple stuff starts going to the tertiary hospital, and then the tertiary hospital is flooded, oversubscribed, and you'll see that happen all over Asia and Africa, where tertiary hospitals are giving basic services, which should have been done at the district level hospital. So the focus, one of the key recommendations of this commission has been the focus on the first level district hospital. And the three bellwether conditions that Andy mentioned was cesarean section delivery, laparotomy, and open treatment fracture. Why do we keep flagging this over and over again? The reason is that hospitals that can consistently provide these three bellwether procedures are likely to be staffed, equipped, and function at a level of complexity that enables the delivery of other related surgical care. And the evidence for that is that if we were to divide the surgical world into must do, should do, and can do, you would find that 
the purpose of all the must-do surgeries are acute, high-value procedures that need consistency through local structures, and less complex and urgent procedures can be delivered through the same structures. Now, as, as we mentioned, that if you are able to do uh, these urgent and emergent surgeries, then it's easier. But the should-do surgeries are usually elective stuff, and they can be done at the camp setting. If you were to see the hospitals, and this is again from the WHO database, the, surge, so the hospitals that provide caesarean section are the blue bars, and you would see that if it's a dilatation and curettage, an obstetric fistula surgery, and tubal ligation or vasectomy, the surgeries, the hospitals that are able to provide caesarean deliveries are the same hospitals which are able to provide other things. And if you are not, then your overall surgical capacity is much lower, even for the elective surgeries. Similarly, for surgeries provided, uh, the laparotomy, the hospitals that can do a laparotomy are better equipped and better manned than uh, the ones who are not. And even if you notice on the right side, the hernias and the hydroceles, even those are surgeries which are not done in these kind of hospitals. So you would expect that a lot of hernias uh, hospitals would exist and less uh, uh, hospitals would be able to do um, laparotomies, but that's not usually the case in LMICs. Very similarly for orthopedic provision of care, hospitals which treat open fractures are able to do amputations, closed uh, treatment of fractures, club foot repairs, and various other procedures. And the other hospitals are usually not well manned. And that's the whole logic behind the bellwether procedures. And as I said, the op we still need to work in the LMICs how to optimize the usage of secondary and tertiary systems, because they are currently flooded with um, primary and secondary level care. And what should have been the main task of the tertiary hospitals, which is uh, complex radiology, pathology, laboratory testing, and system-wide education, training, and research is not happening because all the clinicians are flooded with work which is uh, at, from the primary level. There are lots of issues as far as health delivery management goes. I'd like to flag three of them. One is blood. What do we do about blood in, in places where there's no blood? We, use, we do something called unbanked blood transfusion which means you take blood from a donor and then very quickly test it and within an hour you, you transfuse it to the, next, to the patient. It's illegal. But that's the only way we manage to keep going. Now the point is, how do we raise our current figure of 3.9 donations per 1,000 population to the target of 15 donations per 1,000 population, which is what the commission recommends? <laughs> There are alternatives. There is tranexamic acid. We've got to get um, uh, adequate and safe testing kits. We have to train providers on safe transfusion practices, and we have to assess for well-distributed banking and delivery infrastructure. So these are the aspirational goals from where we are today. And that would reduce the third delay, because you can't start a surgery because there's no blood available, or the district hospital is pushing the patients to the tertiary hospital because there's no blood available. And we in the commission believe that whole transferring the patient from one hospital to another does not improve care. It's a myth. It's called the myth of transfer. The second is important is all the equipment, all the equipment. In fact, one of the hospitals that we visited had a whole, uh, had a whole junkyard of equipment, donated equipment, and they labeled it as junk for Jesus. And, 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 and you have so many donations, 80% of donations come in and they don't work and nobody knows how to repair them. And the whole point is that I think it's doing, uh, doing the LMIC a disservice by dumping equipment which they can't <coughs> handle or use or repair. And they think they've got it and it, it, it's not really there. So what we really need, and the commission strongly recommends, is building local equipment maintenance capacity. And some of the good examples that we have, uh, the good initiatives, have been on, on the biomedical equipment technician <coughs> training program uh, of various GE Foundation, Engineering World Health, and Duke's uh, College of Engineering. The third is managers. Though in the LMICs, 
a lot is blamed for low resources. It's not only the low resources which is a problem, it's actually managing all the resources which is a problem. And there, we are not really good at those systems because clinicians double up as managers, they, they are not very good managers. And I think uh, a, um, um, having a cater of professional managers would make a big difference, and that's one of the strong recommendations of the commission. And they would obviously fill in and work alongside clinicians who are oversubscribed currently, and that would be a good strategy to reduce the third mm -hmm. delay. This is my, uh, these are my partners, mentors, guides in this working group, and I would like to thank all of them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. I'm also very happy to tell you I graduated MBBS, Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery, and I had a, an initial aspiration to be a general surgeon, and then I decided to be a pediatrician. Then I really found out where health is delivered, in communities where people live, work, and play, and I'm a community physician. I joined my colleagues to welcome the report of the commission. We're very excited about its clear link to integrated comprehensive healthcare delivery and strengthened health systems. Health systems are things that have been around with us for a very long time, and each, each program has defined its own health system. Perhaps this is one of the reports that have looked at an integrated health system that is not siloed and is not thinking to deliver its own portion alone or, did, or strengthen a system for its own service. So we very much welcome that. We welcome that because we support a continuum of service delivery from home-based care to tertiary care. Maternal mortality is not going to be reduced in our country by antenatal care alone. Simple vaginal delivery doesn't kill. I'm here because I've experienced it three times and it didn't kill me. Many of my colleagues, however, die when simple vaginal delivery becomes complicated and there is no surgical care to give effective caesarean surgery, caesarean section, to remove retained placenta, to even do simple episiotomies can be a life-threatening condition in many of our countries. And so the report and the emphasis of the commission is really very welcomed. There are opportunities within the system to take forward this, this recommendation. Components of the health systems act in synergy. In many of our countries, we have different parts of the component being invested in by different people. So WHO invests in information systems, World Bank invests in supply chains, somebody else invests in um, procurement, another person invests in policy, another person invests in policy. And so there are frag there's a big fragmentation of the health system. From the service delivery point to actually tertiary care, there's a, there's, a, there's a significant fragmentation of health systems. The interdependence and interprofessional functionality we have in health systems is often missing. And words like task shifting, health workforce, take us away from what I learned, the concept of a health team, where surgical teams work with medical teams to produce health care, and non-clinical staff as well as clinical staff are critical to producing health care. I think this report very, very clearly addresses that issue, and we welcome that as well. All progress in global health, from HIV AIDS to maternal and child health, have identified the issue of health systems as the one limiting factor that is preventing the scale of our success. We're looking at new priorities in non-communicable diseases. One of those new priorities that is actually challenging our countries at the moment is the increasing incidence of cancers. Cancers are going to require surgery, and we don't have surgical capacities. In our experience in the Odo State Learning Site, we did not have much problem with finding community health workers, a million more, would be a problem, but we didn't find any problem accessing community health workers. We did not find a lot of access increasing the quantity of nurses we have. And quite frankly, in Nigeria, we have 75 schools of nursing, and we're ready to share brain of nurses because we're producing much more than we can absorb. The challenge in the Undo State Learning Site came when we required things like orthopedic care, anesthetic care, critical care diagnosis, 
care for people, on, uh, people in the coma. Those things that typically occur in surgical environments we did not have. Our challenge at that time was also not, not the quantum of primary health care we needed. It's, in, they're, they're, it's important and it does qualify, contribute to health care. But our problem was the supervision of community health workers, middle level health workers, and those at primary care level. There was just not enough specialists, not enough trained and qualified specialists to provide the oversight that this primary care system needed. In addition, even when we were able to pull brain across several states and say we would employ locum from other states, the quality of care was also a problem because we didn't have enough standards and protocols that would help us to deliver the quality of care that would actually save lives and not result in unintended morbidity through the, through to, due to poor quality of care. It is very interesting and very exciting to see that this report also addresses the issue of standards and protocols, and it does so not just from a developing country perspective, from a developed country perspective, but also from our perspective, the production, the training, and the fact that a health workforce is required, not just a health worker, a skilled, resourced, and competent health workforce, where team building, rather than struggling to share tasks, is the issue and the norm. And that is what we need at the moment. I, I would like to just conclude by looking forward. Beyond 2015, in what way could we as advocates for health systems building, advocates for health, support the, com the promotion of this, of this very important report? We will maintain a strong focus on health systems as the vehicle that helps us to scale the unfinished agenda, not just for one issue, but for all our issues. We would also promote and integrate this, in, uh, this, promote this integrated health system as they respond to our emergent priorities of non-communicable diseases, road traffic accidents, conflicts, natural disasters, and for my sake, chronic backache. <laughs> we, would, we would look at building supervisory and referral systems. In 2005, we published a report called The Back Office. The back office looks at how referral and supervisory systems strengthen healthcare. It's not unique to surgical care alone, it's unique to all levels of care. Malaria is not going to go away if we cannot handle severe malaria. Severe malaria requires a strengthened health system that is tertiary, and we don't have that. Many people are going to begin to experience episodes of severe malaria because bed nets are now working. We're also going to look at supporting many of the five shifts that Richard has talked about. A paradigm shift is our focus. Our paradigm shift looks at three main issues. One, a paradigm shift from a health worker to a health workforce. A paradigm shift from domestic, from overseas development assistance alone to domestic financing, including innovations in subjective financing that allows us to integrate the community health worker into the health workforce. A paradigm shift that says that there is a basic package of health systems interventions that will deliver on a package of services. We don't know what that package is. We don't understand the synergy between those packages. We don't know what, how much of a control knob or a, or a health system block it is, but we know that the effect of the absence of blocks or, or, or knobs is killing our people, and health systems should be classified as a cause of death. Our last paradigm shift that we shall support is accountability. Within the framework of every woman, every child, we continue to support independent accountability. But we go beyond independent accountability to say we actually need accountability to matter and accountability to be honest. In the days where attribution to life saved means that your replenishment is filled, and um, we begin to question some of the reports from the uh, traditional duty bearers, and we want accountability to matter. We want partners to be accountable to the talk they have at the global level and to walk that talk at the local level, ensuring that partner accountability matters in our country, just as most as national government accountability. I want to thank you all for listening to me and to call, to, to, to call the Royal Society of uh, Medicine as well as other faculties in the UK and, and, and beyond that mentoring our institutions is the greatest thing you can do for us. Mentoring our institutions to strengthen a continuum of service delivery package from community to tertiary care is one of the key things this report puts on the table and we thank you for that effort. Thank you, Lola, for those very apposite comments. I'm not going to comment at the moment, but I profess to.
David Waters. Thank you very much. I'd, I'd like to speak, first of all, as uh, someone who spent 15 years of my life working in Zambia and Papua New Guinea and the developing world, and also someone who, through the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons, have supported surgery in the Pacific and Papua New Guinea and Southeast Asia uh, for the 15 years since I, I left a, a low and middle income country. And the first thing I'd like to say is that everything that Dr. Uh, Professor Roy has said is actually true. And it certainly matches with my experience working in a country where we're all trained in ATLS or AMST, uh, as we call it in uh, Australasia. And uh, the golden hour of trauma simply at the moment doesn't exist if you're working in these countries because the patients don't get to hospital that quickly. Let's hope that that will be one of the things that changes. People don't come to hospital, and Dr. Professor Roy talked about these three delays, partly because they don't believe that there's any point in coming to hospital. And so we do need to fix the system, and in order to deal with the first two delays, we actually need to convince people that if they actually get there, the third delay won't happen, and they will get the care that they need. And so that's actually a really important uh, message. We all believe, because we are the believers who are here in this room, that the sustainable development goal of promoting universal health coverage is actually worthy. Everyone here will probably support strengthening health systems and surgical and anesthetic care, so, but they not only need to be supported, they need to be integrated within the whole system. And integration is one of the buzzwords of healthcare at present anyhow. There cannot be universal health coverage without ad addressing the deficiencies of surgical and anesthetic care, as we've already heard as one of the key messages of the Commission. But to do this effectively, we will need to measure performance. And that was why Richard Horton looked the three of you in the eye and said, you must have indicators. And if we are to actually deliver over the next 15 years it is absolutely vitally important that we measure the impact of what we do and measure the performance of the health system we are seeking to uh, support and improve. The 68th uh, World Health Assembly will meet in three weeks' time. And resolution number 31 is about strengthening emer emergency and essential surgical care. I hope that the 194 ministries of health that gather there will lend their support to what will be an iconic move moment for global surgery uh, if a resolution on surgery as a whole is passed. I believe that this Lancet Commission document and report will be vital to informing uh, the future about how to actually do that to strengthen emergency and essential surgical care, particularly in low and middle income countries, uh, the ones who most miss out on surgical care at present. All of us must be willing to help use and promote the measures and indicators that will come out. And there are six of them in this report. I would also like to highlight that WHO in its list of 100 global health indicators in November has included some on surgery, including perioperative mortality rates, including the volume of emergency and elective surgery per 100,000 population, including measures of access and measures of health workforce. And therefore, there is great hope that the connection between a resolution and between those indicators is actually made in the next few years. If we were to be holding this meeting in 2030, and I hope we will have a follow-up meeting in 2030, I hope that we will be able to review the result of uh, what this commission uh, and the surg global surgical community have actually contributed to the improvement of safe surgical and anesthetic care when needed. There will be far less death and disability in our world as a result of failure to access surgery. Never again in history will surgery be perceived as something that's expensive 
or not a critical part of the health system. I also believe that in 2020, 2030, if we succeed in implementing the messages of this commission, the world will be both a healthier and, as this report I think will prove to you, it will be a more prosperous place, particularly those who live in what was in 2015 were called low middle income countries. Many of them will no longer be low middle income countries if we invest in a better health system that includes surgical and anesthetic care. So the, the key vision of promoting universal access to safe and affordable surgical and anesthetic care when needed is ad absolutely vital for our world. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments, David. I'd like to move on to Mid now. Yes. Okay. So you don't need to put something on. You, can you hear me? Yes. I so think you probably need to move closer. To closer? Me. Okay. So, um, I, as a third person in the, in the row, in the panel, uh, me, we too, uh, we are excited about the report, and I think it's a really thorough report. And where I'm particularly happy is that it has a real good information on what is the gap and what needs to be done. So this, this indicator, for example, of how many surgical intervention on a population basis, this is something I have been looking for since a long time because we were doing a population based service to, to see what is the access to essential healthcare. And in fact, we did not have such an indicator. We know it for cesarean sections. We know it maybe for the outpatient departments. We start to know it for the hospitalization rates, but not for surgery. So this is really, uh, uh, very good, and uh, uh, I think we hope. I hope also we can discuss further now. How are we going to do this? Because this is going to be the crux of the matter, of course. Um, I have to say, of course, that as MSF, we're a bit uh, disappointed that there is no speak about the crisis situations, the humanitarian emergencies that they have been excluded from the discussion, because. Uh, Obviously, uh, in our organizations, I, we have realized some years ago that we had to invest more in surgery, uh, surgical capacity and anesthesia, and uh, because this was something that was underserved, particularly in uh, emergency situations. So we think also that it is important to include it because if you want to speak about resilient health systems, at least some idea of being prepared, having scenarios, contingency plans need to be included. Otherwise, I don't see really where the resilient part comes in, uh, for, in, in terms of a system. We, we know this is a, a concept that is used a lot, but uh, in emergencies we have some questions about the resilience because it has been, it's not so clear what is a good indicator of a resilient system. It's not so clear also what should you do to make the system more resilient. And especially um, it is, there is some interpretations that link it very strongly to sustainability, uh, what was mentioned by uh, David Horton. And uh, in the terms of they ha the system has to make sure that they are independent of external aid, which is uh, maybe an interesting concept, but not always the reality. So uh, f even for the Ebola, for example, you will see this uh, polarization. It says systems, not suits. Sorry, we need boats. We need gloves also. Right? We, so the resilient system needs to be uh, including that also. Um, so on the health systems. Um, generally, we in um, MSF, in Dr. Sweda Bols, we speak much more about the health services, uh, the offer and the access, the real utilization of it. And of course, the systems must support this uh, healthcare uh, output. And uh, it's true that Often systems might be more of a hindrance than a help to do that. A lot of places we work in, at least, they have fragile health systems. But it's not so clear now, how do you make these systems less fragile? I'm, I'm a bit reluctant to say strengthen the health system, because some health systems 
um, it might be difficult to see also how you do that improving uh, the support for the healthcare and the output for the patients without strengthening some of the obstacles also in there. And uh, often uh, as a bit of a, yeah, a bit, a bit of a, I, let's say a joke, I say, well, health, we might, might need more health system change in, and not only strengthening because there is a lot in the system that is part of the problem. There is quite some vested interest and so that needs to be done. Okay, so um, definitely there is things that we can do and that are quite important to do. The supply issue has been mentioned, the supply channels, uninterrupted, um, a sufficient quantity, good quality, this is really important. The health workforce, you will discuss it uh, later in the next panel also. And then I just want to speak a bit more about the access. I've been working a lot on financial access and what I see is that at different levels, at the different stages of access that were mentioned here, it plays a major role. In the report, there is a lot of attention put onto the catastrophic health expenditures. And I wonder if you, you know also the term iatrogenic poverty. It's the induced poverty by health interventions. And so, uh, yes, surgeon, surgery is part of, of that problem often. But um, in, in next to uh, these catastrophic expenditures, these are really for the people who are able to access surgical care. All the rest out there that never reach the hospital, never have access, they have problems with financial barriers, but they are excluded or they come uh, delayed uh, for the care. So um, it, is, it is a reality uh, still today. And um, for example, I was in uh, Monrovia, uh, uh, beginning of February, and there you have to put money on the table before they want to look at, at you, even in the hospital, in a GFK hospital. You have to put 40 or $70 up front before you can access the hospital. And it's interesting, if they think there is surgery involved, it's higher. So you know that you have to put a higher caution. In places like DRC, uh, you, you have, uh, the hospitals is, is a bit of a pawn shop. You can leave your instruments, your agricultural tools, your, uh, your clothes, your bike, and so on, as a, uh, to make sure that you can uh, access care and then uh, pay the, the hospital back. There is a, a little joke going in Kinshasa also sometimes saying that there are certain hospitals where the population says, well, if you go and have a cesarean section in that hospital, your child might walk before you are released from the hospital, before you have paid your bill. So I, I didn't invent that. That is really... So this is the reality, and I think it is this really... I think it's so wonderful, really, that the surgery community, surgical community, is looking beyond their operation theater, beyond the, the hospital, and really looking at where are the patients that they should be seeing and should be caring for. Um, I w if, if I may, I just wanted to um, uh, make sure that also that we take into account indeed the referral services. These are really a big problem, and it does not only cut you. Uh, you know, the, you showed it very nicely how to arrive at the hospital. It influences the whole line. In Lesotho, we um, we work in a maternal health program and. Um, we did some surveys in the populations to see how financial access barriers uh, played a role. And the women, they say, well, if I do, I, I'm reluctant to go to the health center, because in the health center, if I have a complication, they will refer me to the hospital. And at the hospital level, I have to pay. The ambulance, I have to pay also. So middle of the month, I will prefer to plan for a home delivery because middle of the month, the, the money is running out. So it is, people are really deterred from the start to, uh, to be able to reach the, the right care that they need. And um, one thing that is not coming up very strongly, I think, in the, in the report is about the adequacy of the surgery. 
Uh, so the indications, really important. And especially in places where the health system runs on user fees or private out-of-pocket uh, expenses, including in the public sector, there is, of course, a creative use of indications for surgery. And um, in, in, in Kinshasa, for example, I have never well, there is a, like a bit of an epidemic of appendicitis, of appendectomies going on. So as soon as people have, um, there is the wallet really that is more uh, influencing what care you will receive in both ways. So for, for the fistula also, uh, in Burundi we did a program on fistula. The fi patients that come to the health centers with, and the hospital with fistulas are not necessarily those who are the most uh, interesting economically and so on. So I like very much also the idea that is proposed in there also to make sure if we do health system strengthening to bring in a monitoring by the community, by the patients, by the civil society. This is the thing that makes a, bi a big difference and will help us also to uh, move closer to accountability. I just want to make a last remark, sorry, to, on the global health of it because uh, aspects, because um, in the report, and I think we all here want it to be included, and I think the way it has been done is really very good uh, to make sure that it is not in competition with other health pro uh, global health problems. And so the important thing to be make sure that if we are um, asking and proposing and enthusiastic about doing more, and having more resources for that, that this needs to be additional resources, that it cannot be in competition with existing envelope on, within the health, uh, in the global health envelope. So the middle income countries also that are being put a bit aside, I would really recommend that we look a bit closer to them also. What are the needs there? What are the gaps? And that we don't accept simply that those people do not need uh, specific uh, extra financial support and also extra uh, human resource support. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Mert, for all of those comments. Uh, I'm just going to give a quick summary. Unfortunately, I have um, both a professional and a personal interest in surgery. Um, I keep falling off horses, and I keep having to have orthopedic surgery. So my recent thing is a fractured humerus, and my writing is bad um, due to that. So I'm hoping that I have captured everything, but I can't read my own writing, and it's not just because I'm a doctor. Um, so from Roy, uh, we heard about first-level hospitals and the need to market uh, first-level hospitals and, and surgical care within those. We also heard about the three delays and how it's important for the surgical community to reduce those three delays and how reducing those three delays is not just important for surgery but in, important for the whole medical system. He also talked about the importance of blood. And again, blood is not just important for surgery. It is important for treating people with other causes of anemia. It's also important for treating people with malaria. And we also summarized um, how managers were important. Um, and we need to develop better um, healthcare management systems. We then heard from Lola, who reinforced that healthcare delivery in the community is important. And that from her point of view, there is great fragmentation of the health system at all levels. And we need a workforce which is integrated within the health system. She also, as did David Waters, talked about the necessity for accountability and how important that is from David that at the next WHO resolution on surgery, accountability and the metrics that the Surgery Commission put forward that we'll hear about later today are very important. David also talked about the fact, as did Roy, that high income country training doesn't apply to lower middle income countries. And he reinforced that. <coughs> Mitt talked a lot about health services, not just health systems. And I think that's just something that we had a lot of discussion about in the Commission, is how to in integrate um, 
NGOs into providing health services when the health systems in those countries do not exist to provide those services. And that was, um, yes, we didn't talk very much about conflict within the Commission, but we recognise that it's very important. So thank you, Mitt, for bringing that up. I realise that we're almost at coffee break time and we wanted to have audience discussion. We know today is going to go over time and I would very much welcome questions from the audience despite the fact that we're all desperate to get for coffee. So um, does anybody who is adequately ca caffeinated already want to ask any of the panellists or Roy any questions? Everybody wants coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a question that I would like to ask all of you. If ever. I'm adequately caffeinated. I've had two lattes this morning. Um, so in the UK especially, we talk often about devolving healthcare, so decentralizing healthcare. And I'm just wondering, in lower middle-income countries, does that apply? Should we be decentralizing healthcare or should we be recommending stronger government influence in healthcare? I'm just wondering what all of you think about that. So I'll start with um, Roy. I think a number of countries are experimenting with both models with uh, moderate success. Um, I, I, I think in this interconnected world that we live today, I, I, I think we would be moving towards a decentralized model it is possible to do that because um, in large countries, if the government is going to deliver all the health care, it may or may not be possible. Oh. Uh, Mitt? Yes, uh, so yeah, I think it's important to make sure that all actors that are there and able to provide that there is a collaboration going on. Um, I, I know there is a lot of uh, fear or, or concern about uh, fragmented ways of, of service delivery, but uh, at least in, in the places where we work, I think it is something really important. It's important to make sure that you can be complementary. And uh, it's better to be complementary and flexible, nimble, to, in, in, instead of having just a one a single monolithic way of providing care. I think these things over the years have tended to change a little bit like fashions have. Uh, and I would certainly be in favor of decentralization, but I think the central authority has to set standards so that in fact everybody can actually access health care at, at a minimum standard. And so there has to be, although there has to be local uh, autonomy and local decision making and local engagement in uh, what the priorities are, there has to be standards that people are following. And so strategic direction really needs to be set by the, the Central Ministry of Health and Government. David and Lola, what's your experience? Um, the primary health care approach remains valid, and that involves decentralization of primary health care. But what I'd like to add to it is that there needs to be a continuum of service delivery, including referral and supervision for the primary health care approach to be effective and to work. And that needs to be followed by something we do not often want to do, which is deconcentration of authority from the central level to the local level as well, also in a continuum of governance from primary care to tertiary care. Thank you. Now, a gentleman there had a question, and then another gentleman just yeah. in front of you. Could you stand uh, up and... Yes, I'm Arul. I'm uh, president of FIGO, the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics. We do quite a lot of work on these three delay models. I just, uh, a comment and a question. Comment is about blood transfusion. What we try to do is actually get hold of religious organizations and get volunteers to register with their blood groups so you can really tap any time you want. The question is actually, we find in a number of countries, the number of Surgical obstetricians are not enough. So we have been training midwives to do cesarean sections like in Mozambique. And same way, if you look at the number of health personnel, doctors trained for surgery are very few in sub-Saharan Africa. So what does the panel feel about at least some procedures, like in fractures or appendix? We'll take appendicectomy, which I was mentioned, about training others to do the surgical procedures. Sure. Mm -hmm. You want to answer that? So David's going to answer that question. <laughs> I've seen a number of very good instances where people who are not doctors uh, actually do extremely good uh, surgical procedures. I think the, the key thing is to have a trained provider for both surgery and anesthesia. And I don't think we have to determine 
exactly what the primary qualification of that provider is. They certainly don't need to all be doctors, and they most certainly do not all need to be surgeons, anaesthetists, or uh, obstetricians and gynecologists uh, to do the majority of procedures. And in probably 80 to 90 percent of procedures that need to be done and that are done uh, would not necessarily need to be done by a trained surgeon, anaesthetist, or obstetrician. So I, I think we can promote that in the right regions. Uh, in my experience, uh, in, in different parts of the world, there are some parts of the world who simply wouldn't want a non-doctor provider. And in sub-Saharan Africa, though, that's worked extremely well, and there are good models. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. There's a gentleman in front of you that I think wants the microphone. Could you hand it over? Okay. Could you stand up, sir? And Uh, Bhikkhu Ghosh, I was going to actually mention what you just now said. Uh, regarding health system uh, strengthening, I think we have got to realize to provide surgery and obstetric care and anesthetic care, we need to have the staff who are trained. And to train a surgeon in any country will take a minimum of 12 to 13 years. And we don't have that time. And I think also, if we want to train them, we need to have trainers. Mm -hmm. There are other solutions. And there are, as you mentioned, there are examples of non-doctors, but they are trained in medical care and then to be trained doing surgery. And Ethiopia, there is a program, which is a three-year university program, where health officers are trained to do surgery. They are called integrated emergency surgical officers. And they have been qualifying um, from 2011-12, and already there are almost 300 qualified, and they aim to qualify about 800 to 1,000 by the next five years. And I have got personal communications from them. Within one year, one emergency surgical officer has done 300 cesarean section and about 100 laparotomy in hospital where there is no surgeon. And this would not have happened without it. So I think we need to think about training not only surgeons, but also others who can do surgery in a proper, safe manner, and also to see how we can actually support those systems. Yes. Yeah. Lele is just going to respond to that. Thank you. I, I think it's very important for us to do exactly that. As you say, it takes us a very long time to, to train, to train uh, uh, specialists, but we should not take away from the need that we must have those specialists to supervise and oversee this lower cadre. It's also calling to one of the recommend, one of the things we done in the Ondo State Learning Site is to reconfigure the skills and competence needed within the continuum of service delivery, and then the health workforce needed for that reconfigure recon skills. <coughs> we need to do that as a collective community not just in small programs that allows this to occur without the competition of professionalism that we have now. Thank you for that. Right, I'm just going to allow one more question or comment from Emmanuel, and then I've got something to announce before we go to coffee. Hi, uh, my name is Emmanuel. I'm based in Geneva at the UN. I, I represent uh, Zambia at the UN. Um, on the issue of training and skills, we've done both in Zambia, where we've had other cadres come in, clinic officers, we call them, and licentiates. Later, we call them licentiates. And I think Malawi has also done that on orthopedic assistance. But what we've realized is that uh, we also need to take care of first things first, basically. Like you said, you, you graduate as MBBS, Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery. We have tons, we have a lot of doctors that we have trained who are good in medicine, but not good in surgery. So for us in Zambia, yes, we see that we're going to train other cadres but we're going to start with doctors because we have a lot of them and we send them out to the rural areas at the very early stage and they have to deal with these things. So we have to try and improve their surgical skills. Mm -hmm. Just all the doctors should know how to do a C-section, should know how to manage an open <laughs> fracture. So we will start with that and then we'll go on as we go on to train nurses, to train other cutters. But that's our approach, that we'll deal with the doctors first because we know they are lacking in surgical skills. Thank you very much for that comment. I'm going to have to end comments there. I'd like you to all stay for a little while. I know you need to need your caffeine, but I'd like you to all stay. I'd firstly like to thank our excellent panelists and speakers for the first session of the day. Thank you. Thank you. So, the reason I want you to all stay um, and listen, before you rush off to coffee, 
is I'd like at this stage to pay tribute to one of our commissioners, Edgar Rodas, who, as Roy mentioned, died not so long ago. We all knew him through his dedicated work to the commission. I knew him only briefly, but I quickly realized that he was a kind, passionate, intelligent, and humble man. And he was absolutely delighted to be involved in the commission's work. We are desperately sad that he did not live to see the commission report published. It saddens us greatly that he was not able to be at the Bellagio meeting and he was not able to be with us today. However, Edgar's son, also Edgar, and his wife are in the audience today. And I would like to welcome Edgar's son, Edgar Rodas Jr., to speak briefly about his dad and his commitment to health equity. And I would also like to present these small tributes to you and your organization on behalf of the Commission. Thank you very much. With your permission, I'm going to read a few words that I had prepared because they allow me not to get emotional, so I apologize for that. It is a privilege and honor to stand before you um, and say a few things about my father, Edgar Rota Sr., who passed away in March 2nd and would have loved to be here with you. The commissioners who work with him got to know him a little bit over the, the last year, and I had the privilege of not only having him as my father, but also as a teacher and mentor, a colleague, confidant, and consultant, and finally, as a mate in many surgical missions in the mobile surgical unit program of the Sinterandes Foundation, as a medical student, then as a surgical resident, and now as a surgeon. We shared many unforgettable moments, and I learned from him many things that you cannot find in books, scientific articles, and has hospital wards. His life was one unparalleled devotion of, and service toward the welfare of his patients and their families, especially, especially those in remote areas of my country, Ecuador. He was a man of strong faith and convictions, a man of science, but most importantly, of solidarity, which drove him to his life of service. He received many honors and condecorations. However, I saw him enjoy more deeply simple gestures of gratitude of his patients and, his, and their families. He was and will always be an inspiration for me. His legacy will continue with the work of the Sinterandes Foundation, where he understood health as the true development of human potential and quality of life. After 20 years as head of the Sinterandes Foundation, he commanded over 900 surgical missions in over 7,500 surgeries for the underprivileged. He told me in his last few days that he truly felt he had accomplished his, his mission in life, not only with his work, but also with the contributions to the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery. So I thank the, the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery for allowing me to say these few words as my father would have wanted. The Citerandes Foundation is open to share its results and experience and the benefit of the most needy worldwide. Thank you. <laughs> 